1885, France. In the Chamber of Deputies, the colonial question was at the heart of the debates. Jules Ferry justified the country's colonizing policy by evoking a new civilizing crusade in the name of the duty to bring justice, science, and reason to non-Western countries. Clemenceau replied curtly that colonization is not civilization. Ferry's allusion to the Crusades appealed to the idea of a mission, quasi-transcendent, of a combat against the other, the foreigner, and had to be put back on the right track. However, in the Middle Ages, the Pope's appeal to Christians to deliver the tomb of Christ occupied by the Muslims was not initially part of an attempt to crush them. It was the circumstances that led these armed pilgrims to occupy the lands they crossed, and then to defend them for two centuries. So, let us go back over the main stages of the First Crusade, which conditioned all the others, and let us observe the events that led to Europeans taking over the lands in the East. Jerusalem, the place of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, is the heart of the spiritual world for Christians. The rediscovery and restoration of the holy places under Emperor Constantine, in a Roman Empire now converted to Christianity, throws many faithful on the road. Pilgrimages became the major act of faith of Christians in the Middle Ages. Among these holy places, the Tomb of Christ, called the Holy Sepulchre, is particularly venerated. The long and perilous journey makes pilgrimage a real trial, which many people equate with Christ's passion or way of the cross. In 11th century Europe, the clergy imposed pilgrimage as a penance for troublemakers, and the idea that this act of faith washes away sins developed, allowing the church to remove certain disturbing elements, which had to cross hostile territories, because in the 7th century, a new religion appeared in the Middle East. The arrival of Islam in 622 was accompanied by a phase of irresistible expansion. The Persian Empire of the Sassanians was crushed in 651, and the Eastern Roman Empire managed after an intense struggle to save its head and safeguard part of Asia Minor and the Balkans. In the space of a century, Islam imposed itself in almost all of the Middle East, along the North African coast, and in Spain, in the territory of Al-Andalus organized as a caliphate in the hand of the Abbasid dynasty of the Sunni branch. The seat of power was located in Baghdad from 752 onwards. The Umayyad dynasty remained in Spain. Islam does not prevent Jewish or Christian communities from living on their territories and allows pilgrimages to continue as long as a certain sum is paid and no proselytism is practiced. Relations with the West are not as bad as one might think. Charlemagne made agreements with the Caliph Harun al-Rashid a very relative balance therefore exists, despite the constant clashes between Byzantines and the Abbasids. From 909, the Fatimids of the Shiite branch established themselves in Egypt. They took Jerusalem in 969, an event which traumatized Western Christianity. In 1009, the Fatimid Caliph Al-Hakim destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre amidst an excess of religious intolerance. His successors calmed the situation and made an agreement with the Byzantine Emperor to allow access to the Holy City. Pilgrimages still continued, with a particular influx in 1033, for the millennium of Christ's death. It was then that a new force came down on the Middle East and broke this fragile balance. Converted to Islam in 985, the Seljuks were nomadic Turks, Sunni and rigid. They had a destructive military force and took Baghdad in 1055. The territorial ambition of the Turks became all-consuming. The Byzantine Roman Emperor Diogenes tried to suppress them. He was beaten badly at the Battle of Manzikert. Anatolia was handed over to the Turks. Nicaea and Jerusalem fell in 1078. The Caliphate crumbles into different sultanates, constantly at war with each other, and always subject to the central authority of the Seljuks. Exactions were perpetrated against Christians and Jews. Access to the holy city was cut off. Pilgrimage became impossible. The Europeans didn't react because the lords and barons were too busy quarreling over territories 
or histories of succession. In a period where kings were not yet able to impose their authority, the church tried to bring order to this warlike society by establishing two institutions of peace. God's truce, which suspends fighting for a given period of time, and God's peace, which consists in curbing violence against church property and the poorest. The will to liberate the lands conquered by the Muslims was also on the agenda. The Spanish Reconista was carried out with the blessing of the church, and many lords of the south of France participated. In Sicily, the converted Normans were encouraged to retake the occupied territories, which had been set up as emirates, and above all, the idea of just war, which consists in taking up arms when circumstances require it. During an invasion, for example, was replaced by the idea of holy war, which goes much further and grants forgiveness for the faults of the combatants who shed the blood of the infidels. Alexios Komnenos became emperor in 1081 and undertook a campaign of reconquest in order to recover his territories. He wanted to play on the Turkish divisions. Despite the Great Schism of 1054, which separated Byzantium and Rome on theological issues, the origin of the faith remained common. It is for this reason that he did not hesitate to enter into discussion with the Pope, who could use his spiritual power to support the sending of some troops from the West in the fight against the Turkish Muslim enemy and the defense of the Church of the East. Pope Urban II heeded the call. At the end of the Council of Clermont, before a crowd gathered outside the city, Urban II delivered a sermon that would change the course of history. He evoked the misfortunes of the Eastern Christians, Byzantine, Greek, and Armenian, and called for the union of all Christians to go and liberate the territories from the Turkish yoke. He granted those who made this journey a plenary indulgence, the salvation of their souls, even to soldiers. An exalted monk, Peter the Hermit, cried out, Deus volt, God willing. The enthusiastic crowd took up the chorus. The news began to spread like wildfire. The appeal, initially addressed to the nobles, was taken up and distorted by overexcited preachers who excited the popular circles. This monk from Amiens, who swept the crowds away, Peter the Hermit, did not wait for the barons to organize themselves in order to follow in Christ's footsteps. A heteroclite army started marching in the spring of 1096, made up of peasants, women, and children all kinds of miserable people and knights without masters. The term crusade did not appear until two centuries later, derived from the word cross because of the cross sewn by these pilgrims on their clothes, who then considered themselves soldiers of Christ. The crusade of Peter the Hermit led to an outbreak of massacres and exactions against the Jews, who were considered responsible for the murder of Christ. Many took advantage of this to get rid of embarrassing creditors and to write off their debts. Even though the preacher tried to calm his troops, indiscipline reigned. After going along the Danube, skirmishes led to the capture of Belgrade and the murder of 4,000 men. On learning of the arrival of the army of the King of Hungary, the pilgrims courageously left the city. In the wake of Peter the Hermit, other popular crusades were shaken, called Germanic, and were even more anarchic. Faced with this outburst, King Coloman massacred a good part of this second popular wave. Peter the Hermit managed to reach Constantinople. Alexios Komnenos quickly preferred to settle this crowd on the other side of the Bosphorus. Eager to reach Jerusalem, the army of fortune ventured into enemy territory, sure of itself. The Seljuk army eagerly waited for them. Nearly 20,000 men were slaughtered. The People's Crusade came to a pitiful end. The few survivors joined Byzantium and became part of the Barons' Crusade. They are the originators of the Tafurs, bloodthirsty fighters who are said to have eaten human beings during various sieges, terrifying the Muslims with their reputations as cannibalistic barbarians. In Europe, the mobilization of the knights surprised the papacy, which could not bring all the armies under a single command. The troops were divided according to their point of departure. In addition to the barons of the Midi, who had taken part in the Reconquista, such as Raymond of saint gilles the Lords of the North were added, Godfrey of Bouillon and his brother Baldwin, Hugues of Vermandos, brother of King Philip I, Robert Courthose, Duke of Normandy. The Normans of Sicily also joined the journey. The departure of the official crusade was set for August 1096, after the harvest, in order to ensure better supplies. The routes taken were those traced by the pilgrims. 
Discipline was better observed, and the different armies met in Constantinople between December and April. The Byzantines witnessed this influx of men in armor, considered barbarians, and they indiscriminately called them the Franks. The plans of Alexios I were thwarted. He just wanted military assistance in the form of troops, which he would have incorporated into his army. The emperor was a fine diplomat who was wary of those hordes and sent escorts to the lords to receive them with great pomp. He organized the supply of the armies and, by playing on this crucial point, succeeded in receiving the allegiance of the barons who swore an oath to him. The Frankish lords would have to return the conquered territories to the empire. The crusade became part of Byzantine politics and succeeded in achieving a synthesis of objectives. Restitution of lost lands for the Greeks and liberation of places of worship and enslaved Christians for the Latins. Godfrey of Bouillon, joined by Peter the Hermit, was the first to lay siege in front of Nicaea. Their reinforcements intercepted. The besieged Turks preferred to negotiate a secret release with Alexis. On the morning of June 26th, the flag of the Byzantines flew over the city. The Crusaders began to doubt the Emperor's good faith and accused him of double dealing. In early summer, the assembled Crusader armies advanced, led by Tatikios, a Byzantine-like cavalry commander representing the Emperor, and the Seljuks, surprised the Beaumont vanguard on the plains of Dorilea. The barons galloped to the battlefield and, charging fiercely, forced the Turks to flee. The Crusaders then discovered the strengths of their opponent, a cavalry in high-performance armor, but above all, mounted archers, capable of fast and accurate fire. The western facade of Asia Minor was recovered. After an attempt to blockade Turkey at Herculea, Anatolia found itself defenseless. The group split up and liberated several cities. Tarsus, Adana, Mamastra, and Caesarea were handed over to the Armenian Christians for the kingdom of Cilicia, Placentia, and Germacia to the Byzantines. The city of Edessa was liberated by Baldwin, who returned it to its Armenian ruler, Phoros, celebrated as a hero. The crusader maneuvered in order to be designated heir. By a strange coincidence, Forrest was assassinated and Baldwin regained the throne. The country of Edessa, the first Latin state in the east, was created. All the troops then moved to the stronghold of Antihoc, where the siege began on October 20th. The city was well protected. 400 towers made up the wall and the terrain was steep. The Turks held out for seven months, while the difficulties of supply plunged the crusaders into famine. Morale was at its lowest. The Byzantine Tatakios left. We caught Peter the Hermit trying to sneak away. He was forced back. 20,000 men went in search of food, ransacked the surrounding countryside. At regular intervals, the Turkish armies attacked the troops, but the Franks always prevailed. A renegade managed to open up the gates of Beaumont in June. The banner was hoisted on the highest tower. Exhausted crusaders finally captured the city. The Turks began to understand the need to organize and unify. An army of 30,000 men, under the authority of Emir of Mosul, Kabosia, was set up. The troops arrived in front of the Antioch. The former besiegers now became the besieged. Famine raged. Despair assailed the Crusaders. It is then that a priest had a vision. The Holy Spear, a weapon that would have pierced the right flank of Jesus, is under St. Peter's Church. We dug and we found the relic. We still wondered about the authenticity of the object, but for the Crusaders, hope was reborn. They were totally exhausted. Beaumont took advantage of the euphoria to lead a surprising assault on Kabosia. The Seljuk army, surprised, was defeated. Victory was complete. A turning point occurred in the relationship between Byzantium and the Franks, after what the Franks considered a betrayal by Alexis I. Arriving with a relief army while the Crusaders were under siege, he turned back when he learned that the forces of Kabosia were superior to his own. By this act, the Franks considered themselves released from their engagement. The break with the empire is now consummated. After bitter disputes between Western leaders, the second Eastern Latin state, the Principality of Antioch, was created. This territory fell to Beaumont, leader of the decisive attack that saved the besieged Crusaders. The Crusaders embarked on the final act of their conquest, the road to Jerusalem. 
Ironically, the city was returned to the hands of the Fatimid Egyptians who did not persecute the pilgrims. The barons refused the Shi'i embassies. At this point, they wanted to take the sacred city. The hatred between the Fatimids and the Seljuks served them well, and no Turkish army was really opposed on the way. The cities, preferring to pay ransoms to the Crusaders, eager to see them crush their Egyptian enemies. The barons laid siege to Jerusalem on June 7, 1099. Having left Europe with more than 100,000 people, there were no longer 1,200 horsemen and 20,000 infantrymen. Processions were even organized around the city. But a Genoese fleet came as reinforcements, with food and wood, which would allow the construction of catapults and mobile towers, covered with animal skins, to ward off the wildfire of the Fatimids. On the morning of the 14th of July, the assault was launched. Godfrey managed to seize the northern ramparts. His troops climbed the impressive walls with the help of towers and ladders, and then opened the gate. Raymond de saint gilly faced more sustained Fatimid resistance, which eventually gave way. The Muslims retreated toward the center, but the Crusaders made no quarter. It was a massacre. All Muslims, even refugees in the mosques, were going to be put to the sword in the following days. The city was totally plundered and the shrines of other religions desecrated. This appalling carnage, the humiliation, gradually brought the Muslims closer together in the face of this common enemy. On the evening of July 15th, dressed in clean robes and barefoot, the Crusaders went to the final place of their pilgrimage in arms, the Holy Sepulchre. They sang the Office of the Resurrection. Their mission was accomplished. What should we do now that the holy city has been liberated? Since the creation of the first Latin states, it seemed obvious that the Crusaders were not just passing through. The third Latin state of the East was created. To lead this kingdom of Jerusalem, one of the bravest knights of this crusade was chosen, Godfrey de Bouillon. He accepted this mission under the title of Confessor of the Holy Sepulchre. For him, there was only one king in Jerusalem, Christ. The Fatimids who launched a counterattack were defeated at Ascalon, which allowed the defenses of these new Latin states to be organized. Many barons returned to Europe, considering their mission accomplished. The announcement of the capture of Jerusalem provoked a new momentum. These rear crusades were going to come up against things that unified temporarily, and for the most part were stopped in Anatolia. The first part of the 12th century saw a consolidation of the Latin states of the Orient, and even the creation of a fourth, the county of Tripoli. Despite lower forces, it had the significant advantage of being supplied by the sea. The divisions and internal quarrels of the Turks and the Fatimids had a lot to do with this successful implantation in the Middle East. The appropriation of these lands by the Frankish lords, which was not the main purpose of this armed journey, testifies to a certain degree of greed on the part of the barons, but also to a more religious desire aimed at linking the spiritual Jerusalem to a more temporal dimension. The First Crusade led to other crusades, the objectives of which were mainly the defense of these Latin Oriental states against the Muslims, who were going to unify in order to recover their lost territories. It took two centuries. If this video has got more to offer, feel free to comment, and then more importantly, like and share as much as you can. Thanks again for watching and see you soon for another episode.